Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come dies. back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Back, you tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried to How get do the dead come back, Mother? Today, didn't you? You What's the secret? The Reluctant Bride by Iqbal Hussein. As he drives past the Haveli, his mother's warnings flit through his head. Don't relieve yourself under a tree at night. You might disturb a jinn. Never bathe after sunset. Who knows what spirits you'll attract? The feet of a jurail point backwards. The burnt-out mansion has lain empty for decades, unloved by buyers and shunned by locals. The crumbling towers and minarets loom like pitchforks against the near full moon, while bats wheel in and out of the shutterless windows. He detects movement through the gates, and his hand clutches the tawiz around his neck before remembering he lost it years ago. Devoid of its protection, he touches his earlobes instead. As he navigates the country roads, he drums the dashboard and launches into an old film song, his nasal tones cutting through the fut 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 of the engine. Having plied his trade at night for so long, he would struggle with the madness of the day. Even in these small hours, he finds passengers, a broken-down car, a party-goer missing the last bus, an urgent dash to the hospital. The money may not be much, but he lives simply. Something large darts across his path. What the... He swerves, mounting the pavement straight for a pair of ornamental wrought-iron gates, the Haveli. Distracted by his singing, he has somehow ended up here again. He slams the brake and releases the handlebars. The steering column jabs into his chest. Smoking agarbati, an assorted talisman litter the interior. All is silent, apart from a high-pitched ringing deep inside his ears. Then, with a rush, he returns to the land of the living. He tentatively unfurls himself and the horn stops blaring. Before he can inspect himself, he is arrested by a sound that chills his flesh. A woman sobbing. He shakily swings his legs out of the driver's seat. Peering across the road, he sees nothing but endless fields of corn rippling in the wind. Hello, he calls out. Down here. Auptiko? The crying ceases. From a distance, the lowing of an ox carries through the air like the plea of a dying man. Then a figure emerges from behind a giant peepal tree, stepping into a shaft of moonlight. For the second time that night, he stops breathing. Before him is a woman in full bridal dress. A highly decorated red dupata cowls her head. She is bedecked with gold, a tikka sunburst pendant over her forehead, a nose chain across her cheek, swathes of necklaces around her throat. In the cold light, her scarlet gown is the colour of dried blood. He remembers stories about jurails resting under peepal trees, how they lure the unsuspecting by hiding their ghastly features in the guise of an attractive woman, sometimes a man. Her face is in shadow. He glances down, but her legs and feet are swathed in the folds of a lenga. As she approaches him, she stumbles, throwing her arms out and sending her gold bangles clattering. Her hands are withered and burned. He flinches, and she draws back. Guilt floods through him. My mother, may Allah be merciful upon her soul, would not let me leave you here. Please, come. She opens her palms to show they are empty. What he thought were burns are in fact elaborate patterns drawn in henna. He gathers her meaning. No, 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 I I wouldn't dream of it. She scans the road. He reassures her they are the only ones abroad at this hour. He understands it isn't proper for a lone woman to be in a vehicle with a strange man at any time, let alone at night. With the lenga concealing her feet, she glides towards him. Halfway across, she stops, pressing the back of her hand to her mouth. A sniff's replaced by a gasp. He turns away. It has been many years since he has made use of a looking-glass. 
but he knows what she sees. He calls over his shoulder. Sister, please, it is not safe. You don't know who you might meet. He swallows an urge to add, or what? Normally, there is at least a silhouette, but tonight there is just blackness. Beware the person who casts no shadow or reflection. Adjusting the mirror, his fear gives way to relief as the woman shifts into view. Her head is dipped, her painted hands upturned on her lap as though in prayer. He is reluctant to drive around his usual haunts. Even at this hour, they may come across someone who registers the rickshaw and its unusual passenger. A woman's reputation can be smeared by a gossiping tongue. Instead, he ploughs deeper into the countryside, aiming for the nearest big town. The petrol gauge is at midpoint. He will need to be mindful, as there will be few places along these long, remote stretches at which to refuel. He sees her look up and gaze out of the glassless windows. She gives her hand to the night. The flickering moonlight picks out eyebrows inset with jewels, lips dark as pomegranate seeds, and the pale complexion of the worldly. Clearing his throat, he asks if there's somewhere he can drop her off. Several seconds pass before she answers, I have nowhere. I have made my bed, and I must... She leaves the sentence hanging. He is thankful the night conceals his blushes. No, no problem. I'll keep driving. His nasal delivery compares poorly against her rounded tones. He tries to soften it. Forgive me, sister, but who? Why? What happened? The air ruffles her dupata. My education, my dreams, my hopes. They all counted for nothing in the end. The headlamps light up a semicircle of barely a metre in front, the rest of the road remaining in darkness. It should have been the happiest day of my life, she says. I was betrothed to him since I was a little girl. He pictures two school-aged children, holding hands, giggling and skipping. She swiftly disabuses him of this notion. He is twenty years older than me. His grip falters and the rickshaw bucks like a skittish horse. Today was the first time I met him, she says. You know, it's not so unusual. He speaks with exaggerated cheeriness, waggling his head. M my own sisters saw their husbands only two or three times, she snaps, and that makes it all right. He shrugs. He has never thought about the question of right. It's just how it has always been. He is handsome, she says. Fair of skin, well respected. Wah, wah, he exclaims, hands momentarily raised in the air as though weighing up her good fortune. My mother, peace be upon her, would say he is a first-class match. She glares at him in the mirror. But I do not love him. The mention of love sparks memories. Fragments of a face he once knew flash onto his windscreen before disappearing into the night. Love. The woman spits the word out like it was a bitter gourd. All they care about are dowries and how much gold their daughters will get. Come, sister. Our parents just want the best for... You're a man. What would you know? All oh, this. He glances up at the mirror as she sweeps her hands angrily over her bridal gown. Is the fate of women to be seen as chattel? There must be something you can... Without warning, she screams and smashes an arm onto the ledge, the vibration travelling through the metal and into the springs of his seat. She screams again and again, each time punctuated by the crash of heavy bangles. He slams on the brake, throwing up dust devils before rushing out to check on her. She cowers in the back, twisted at an unnatural angle, sobbing. Blood trails down her forearms. He blinks and the blood morphs into tendrils of henna. Her tears are accompanied by another sound, the banshee-like howls of wild dogs. He surveys their surroundings, but only discerns vague forms in the inky night. The hunting calls build, suggesting the dogs are on the move, in their direction. Someone, or something, whispers in his ear.
He yells and spins on the spot, flapping his hands by his head. There's no one there. The woman is still curled up on the seat, weaving. Once more his fingers reach for the long-lost Tawiz. Scuttling back to the cab, he twists the throttle to its maximum, putting distance between themselves and the dogs. Can I take you to your family? His throat is dry, and he has to repeat himself. She springs upright. His grip tightens on the handlebars, the old scars on the back of his hands raised in ridges. Her hair is worn loose, slick strands framing her face. In the mirror, her coal-rimmed eyes flash into his, and he is forced to look away. Only if you want to deliver me to my death, she snarls. He's reminded of dialogue from the melodramatic films he used to watch. But there is truth in what she says. By abandoning her husband, she has put the Izat of both families at stake. Women have been pushed down wells for lesser crimes. The moonlight highlights her nose, mouth and chin, the dupata shielding the rest of her face. Her lips are parted, the tips of her teeth glinting. He hears his mother's warnings. Silently he sends up prayers for her and recites the kalmas for himself. The Haveli, our very own tragedy, she lurches forward, making him jump. With her breath on the nape of his neck, he struggles to concentrate. But please, sister, it, it's better if you... That poor boy, his sweetheart, trapped inside, she intones as though reading from a headstone. He shivers, women unnerve him, and this woman in particular. He prefers the company of his male passengers, and has formed friendships with some, even if pursued more from his side. And there's a prejudice born out of partition, she continues, settling back with a thud. He tilts his head. Partition? No boy of his would marry an Indian girl, and less so for love. They say he struck the match himself. The straight road, the hypnotic lilt of her voice, the drone of the engine. Her words recede as his imagination takes over. His eyes resound with the whoosh of ignited kerosene. Soot clogs his nose and throat. He feels the desperation of the doomed lovers as burning timbers and searing heat block their escape. A pothole shuts him awake. The woman is talking about her husband of one night, a powerful landowner. With her own family's fortune from cotton, the match was deemed auspicious by the soothsayer all those years ago. She spent her marriage morning submitting to various beautifying rituals from an army of servants and sisters-in-law. The scents of sandalwood and jasmine filled the cab. The only thing they couldn't give me was love for him. Only when the clock chimed midnight was she allowed to retire. She avoided looking at the marital bed strewn with petals. While her husband bade goodbye to the last of the guests, she escaped by climbing out of the window, scaling the banyan tree outside. She disappeared into the dark streets, hiding in shadows to avoid the few cars and even fewer pedestrians out at that time. She kept moving until she ended up exhausted at the derelict mansion. And that's when you found me. He climbs out, stretching his arms overhead, breathing life into stiff limbs. A brooding of adobe houses lines the road, windows reflecting the fiery sunrise like the ruby-red eyes of very many devils. He glimpses movement behind him. It is the woman, though it doesn't seem possible she could have left the cab so quickly or so quietly. Don't stray far, sister, his voice cuts through the quietude. Scrutinizing her, he sees no sign of pregnancy. Jurails often being ghosts of women who died in childbirth. Her feet remain covered. As the sun travels up her scarlet and gold outfit, she turns into a living ember. He exclaims in wonder. She turns around, her face fully illuminated. His mouth drops open. The early morning heat warms his back. The woman circles him like a moon around the planet, and he is compelled to track her. He steps out of the shadows, instantly bowing his head, unable to meet her gaze. With a jeweled hand, she lifts his face. 
She caresses the grooves and folds as though to make the pain go away. He can't stop his tears. She presses her lips upon his wretched cheeks. He is back in the burning haveli. His ears fill with the roar of the fire. Closer, the cries of someone huddled into him, his beloved Rekha. So this is how it came to pass, crouched behind an armoire, in each other's arms, resigned to the deathly embrace of the choking black smoke and merciless flames. As the night replays in his head, he sobs uncontrollably. I, w I was not able to save her. I, I failed her. I was not able to save her. I failed her. The woman touches him tenderly on the arm. What is it? What is the matter? A voice pulls him into the present. The woman slides off a bangle and offers it to him. Thank you. For everything. Dazed by lingering memories, it takes a few moments for him to respond. No, 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 my mother would never allow it. Please, let me repay my debt. The bracelet slips from her hand and rolls towards him. As she stoops down, her eyes widen. She lurches upright, retreating backward, transfixed by his feet. Sister, what is the matter? he says, scooping up the bracelet and holding it out to her. She trips. He reaches out to steady her, even though she is now halfway down the street. His arm stretches out as though it was made of rubber. The screams that follow reverberate around the houses. Lights flick on and the windows fling open. Get away from me, you monster! she screeches. In his rush to calm her, he forgets about his feet, normally hidden in the footwell of his cab. While he has learned to perfect the human form in every other respect, his feet point forever backwards. He finds himself walking away from her, though his body and face are turned toward her. She shrieks and takes off. A skirt drags over the ground, raking stones and throwing up a train of dust. He turns round and goes after her, his head looking over his shoulder. Please, sister, I did not mean to distress you. From around the bend, a truck, a thundering, malevolent, belching boot. He commands it to stop, but it's too late. Amid an explosion of hydraulic brakes, the fleeting red figure disappears under the wheels of the juggernaut. A sense of helplessness swamps him, followed by a realisation. It is not she who is the ghost. Doors and gates clang open, dogs race out cries of Ya Allah! and similar exhortations fill the air. Above the commotion, a child's voice, It's a Jorai! Look at its feet! As heads swivel in his direction, the man shuffle skips to the rickshaw, throwing himself into the cab, twisting the key, wrenching the starting bar. It won't catch. Stones bounce off the metalwork. Several strike him, but none draw blood. With a final frantic effort, he yanks the vehicle into life and hurtles down the road. In the rearview mirror, he glimpses the truck driver amid the villagers. He is crying, beating his chest, swearing the woman appeared like a ghost from nowhere. Half an hour later, as the sun breaks free of its moorings, he stops. Abandoning the rickshaw, he seeks sanctuary in the peepal tree, the same tree from which the woman stepped out all those hours ago. Daybreak finds him back at the Haveli. Today, he realizes why. The old mansion was his home in life, as it is now in death. It took the bride in red for him to remember who he was. Her kiss has unlocked memories he had long buried. A great heaviness has been lifted off him. It is time. You are ready to come home, my son. He is startled out of his thoughts by the voice. Mother, is that you? He rubs his cheek, which is tingling from where he was kissed. Heat fans out from his face and floods his body. Mother, where are you? His body is on fire. 
He has forgotten what it is like not to feel cold. Mother, I can see you. And, and who is with you? Rekha, can it be? Can it be? He laughs. The boy he once was. The burden he has carried melts into the morning sun. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody come back. Don't they? So this welcome, first of all, to the classic Ghost Stories podcast. Um, this is Iqbal Hussein, and I'm going to read a little bit about a bio, a short bio. Uh, so Iqbal is one of seven writers chosen for the 2021-22 Megaphone Scheme for uh, Young Adults Children's Writers. He's one of 15 emerging writers to feature in the mainstream anthology by Incandescent, with a K, with his short story, The Reluctant Bride, which you've just heard. The publication date for this is uh, mid-2021. His short story, A Home From Home, won gold prize in the Creative Future Writers Awards in 2019. He's a recipient of the inaugural London Writers Awards 2018, and was shortlisted for the Penguin Random House Right Now Scheme 2017. Iqbal is working on his first novel, Northern Boy, about being a butterfly among the bricks. Okay. So that's a formal bio. So why don't you just tell us about the real you? Hi, Tony. First of all, can I just say what an absolute pleasure and privilege it is to be speaking to you, having listened to your podcasts all through lockdown oh, wow. uh, you, you have kept me sane seriously i just love the stories and the range of stories and and the fact that i'm one of your very few real life alive authors yeah. i can't even tell you what, what a pleasure <laughs> that is so thank you so much um when i was writing my short story the reluctant bride it's really funny in the back of my head i always thought it'd be so cool if one day you would be reading out those words on your on your podcast so to have that happen, dream come true. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of, of me, I've been writing short stories on and off for various years. Um, I used to work as a journalist and I used to work in publishing. So my background has always been with words, but very much news led feature stories, um, comment pieces, um, always true pieces. So. Fiction is a bit like journalism in a way because you, you nearly always have to have the beginning, the middle and an end to a story. You need to have um, some way of talking about things where you introduce colour. Um, so in journalism, you often talk about pieces that have colour, where you describe things and smells and sights and sounds and all those things. And I really hope that in the stories that I write, I have those kind of things again, these very sensory descriptions um so the the fiction yet yeah, in my day job i work for a big law firm in the city of london and i work in the in their word processing department i manage a small team of us so, uh, uh, so we basically type up all of the documents in the firm and we edit them and make them look nice so it's all about visuals and in terms of our writing it's, it's interesting i i think fairly visually so i'm quite picture led so in my day job it's all about making something look nice on the page and in my kind of spare time writing stories I again employ quite a lot of visuals and in my head I see the story almost like a film that's going on and it's my task as a writer to get those words and images down onto paper um, and sometimes I'm, I'm successful at doing it and in, in terms of the short story, The Reluctant Bride, it's, it's, it's one of my own favourite short stories of, of all the ones that I've written. It's the only ghost story that I've written, even though I love ghost stories. And I set out purposely to write a ghost story. And it, it was all part of a competition um, a few years ago for a publisher called, uh, I think it's called Golanch or Golanx. Oh, yeah, Golanx, yeah. They're a big publisher. Yeah, they are, yeah. They're massive. So they had a competition for um, writers of short stories to submit a story that was either science fiction or fantasy or horror. And I think it was aimed at writers from the BAME community. Now, BAME just means Black, Asian, minority ethnic. So they were just doing this thing where they were encouraging people, 
people from those backgrounds who we don't normally think of as writing science fiction and horror and genre fiction. And I thought this is such a cool idea. So I started writing The Reluctant Bride. And for the first time in all of my writing that I've ever done, I actually plotted it in advance. So I had a really tight plot. And I thought, right. So I did a two-page synopsis of the whole story. And then I pretty much stuck to it fairly religiously as the short story got written. And the end product really follows it. I was just going to say, so you, you are therefore normally a pantser rather than a plotter. <laughs> I am so much a pantser. Yeah, normally I'll work with various snippets or images that I see in my head and I'll get it down. And, and somehow by magic, I assume it's going to all come together. When I wrote my first book that is currently out on submission, that sadly initially was also written without any plot in mind. So I then spent many years going over the drafts and pumping into it some kind of, uh, some kind of plot. So I've learned a lot by that process that actually, even though I don't find it easy for me to do, I think going forwards, having a plot first and having a synopsis that I can work on and then flesh it out, it is actually just so much easier as you know exactly where it's going to go and how it's going to end. And, and at the risk of getting too technical and losing lots of people, what software do you use, Scrivener or something like that? Do you know, I've tried using Scrivener and maybe I need to try it again. I found it quite complex. I think that the learning curve is quite steep. And at the time, I didn't have enough time to kind of set aside to learn all the, the, where's, the, the wherefores and why fors. So I actually use Word. I use work in, in my job and I know how to, how to set up kind of nice chapters. I know how to format it using styles. I know how to, how to cut and paste kind of large chapters at a time and, and how to get the overview in the navigation pane, as it's called. So I use Word and for me, do you know what? It, it serves a really good purpose. It, it's pretty good. I can see the word count. I can see how it's structured. I can move things around. Um, Scrivener, I need to have another go because so many writer friends use it. I just got slightly scared off by it. It's complicated, but I think um, it's one of the, it's like a Swiss army knife. You know, it can do all sorts of things and you don't have to do everything that it does. Um, anyway, that was a, a bit of a digression, really. So, Northern Boy, this is, the, this is the novel you've got out at the moment, is it? So tell me something about that. So Northern Boy um, got written initially about 10 years ago, and it was... It started off life as being quite semi-autobiographical. So it was almost a memoir when it first started. And it was just slightly fictionalised. And it's, it's set in 1981 and it, and it features um, a young boy called Rafi, who's 10 years old. He's, he's based in Blackburn in Lancashire. So, so, so far, completely autobiographical. It's my story. And, it, and, and it's all about his, his, kind of, his journey into accepting who he is in, a, in a, the Asian community, uh, for one thing, but also the wider white community, which in 1981 is quite um, conservative. He's quite flamboyant and he likes colour, he likes theatre, he loves Bollywood, he likes ABBA. He's always singing and dancing. He's always living in these little fantasy worlds, um, often encouraged by his mother, who, like my own mother at the time, is equally flamboyant and colourful and... Uh, she makes all her own clothes on a, on a faff sewing machine and she never wears the same outfit twice. She's kind of in cahoots with him up to a certain point. And then as he gets older, she thinks, hmm, how will the community think about him, i.e. me slash Rafi? Uh, this young boy who's just colourful, who's refusing to be like the other boys, who just wants to play games all day long and have and be with his girlfriends. And she wants him to be a bit more like his older brother, who's a traditional Asian boy, who like, goes to mosque and is good at sports. Rafi is terrible at sports. He'd rather be playing at um, ABBA concerts and that kind of thing. So it's, it's all about him trying to be himself, his mother wanting him to be who he is, but then worrying about what it means for him to, be, if he continues on that journey of being very colourful, he can't see it, but she and the readers can, can see that obviously Ruffy, while he might not be gay, is certainly, he's, he's going to be something other than the norm around him. So um, it's, yeah, it, it, it was quite a cathartic and quite a painful book to write, but I thought it was a really important book to write because 
we need to see characters like Rafi out there from a community where we don't often see colour and otherness. And it's not necessarily that he's gay, that that's why he needs to be out there, but the fact that he's not towing the party line. And in, and in communities like the Pakistani community, when I grew up, particularly in the 1980s, you kind of had to do, you had to be like everybody else because there was always this fear. What will the neighbours say? What will next door say? It was always about what other people were saying about saving face and how you came across. So, and the school that I went to, my secondary school was extremely rough and just poor. A lot of the North at the time was quite poor. So my family was poor, we were all quite poor. Uh, and yet somehow you get through it and it makes you who you are and you take pleasure in simple things such as playing outside and, and just having a little tight circle of friends and going off in, into your fantasy worlds which in Ruffy's experience is all about ABBA. He likes ABBA because they're exotic. Bollywood, he loves Bollywood because that's completely exotic to him. And that's the kind of life he wants. He wants a life of colour, but instead he's surrounded in these cobbled streets with very Coronation Street style visuals with no colour. It's all grey, it's all brown. We, we need to say something about Coronation Street because I think um, 70% of the people who listen to this have never seen Coronation Street. Ah, Coronation Street is a soap opera set in the north of England, long running. I think it's like 50, 60 years long. And it, it, it is set in the terraces and the, and the cobbled streets of the north. Um, has a huge following. Nearly everyone knows about it. Uh, it's a bit like EastEnders, which is another long running soap, but it's way longer than that. And it has this warmth of the north. Um, so I'm from the north. So I've lived in London for at least 30 years, but in my head, I'm still northern. Um, there's a sense of humour that the North has, there's a sense of warmth, community, camaraderie. Um, I miss it hugely. And the book is, it is kind of a love letter to the North, especially that North of my childhood, which as difficult as it was sometimes, was always, um, was also somewhere that I felt incredibly comfortable in. And I loved my childhood and Ruffy's childhood is very similar. It's not identical to mine. And a plot has had to be introduced that's made it quite different now as well. So the latest iteration of Northern Boy is quite different. But at, at its heart, it, it's a love letter to the North. Mm. That sounds great. Sounds really good. Thank you. And, and, and it's, um, it's, it's going round at the moment, is it? Looking for somebody to pick it up? It is, yes. So I have a wonderful agent, um, Robert Kasky. I've worked with him to put through two, two more versions of the book. And just this week, it's, it's been sent out to editors and publishers. So I'm really hopeful that somebody snaps it up. That would be really fantastic. So that sort of leads me naturally to ask, uh, who do you read? Who are your influences? That's such a good question. I read widely. Uh, so I read anything from children's fiction. Uh, that can be like old children's fiction that I, I loved as a child, like Billy Bunter and... William, the William books I love, and they still make me laugh. They're so well written, beautiful, beautifully written books. Uh, we've done a we've done a ghost story by Richmond Crompton. Uh, I did. Rosalind. I was really surprised. I had no idea. Yes. Yeah, and it was very good. Yeah, but William, I was in stitches. I loved William as, as a kid. You know. Yeah. And you know what? They still work, even as you read them as an adult, because I hadn't realised that when she wrote them, she wrote them for her adult friends, so they weren't written as children's books. Uh, which explains why they're so funny now. And they're just cleverly plotted. And the vocabulary is extraordinary. So I love books like that. I love uh, horror. So uh, Stephen King is obviously a favourite. Another pantser, of course, famously a pantser. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, sometimes I think he would benefit from a little editing as, as his, his books can be slightly overblown. But what do I know? I want to say something there in that I've got a theory that when people are trying to make it, they write very good books because they're very disciplined. And when they become massively successful, editors don't tell them, you know, really, it, this is pointless, cut it out, you know. And they end up with these, uh, you know, Stephen King, you're not allowed to speak ill of him. And I'm not really, I'm just saying, as an example, some of the later works yeah, could have done with some editing, probably, yeah. yeah. It really could have done, absolutely. Um, 
I like him. I like the guy that did the book, The Ritual. I can't remember his oh, name. Oh, yeah. Book, oh, yeah. It, that's a good book. Yes, absolutely. Um, Again, very visual. Uh, folk horror. He's done a folk horror. He's very big. Um, and yes. Adam. Oh, oh, this is very embarrassing. I'll have to put this in later. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay, Adam. I I, I'm tempted to Google it, but I won't. Um, <laughs> um, and I love... Um, any of the classics like Thomas uh, um, Thomas Hardy, he's a particular favourite of mine. Again, because he, he he writes visually and he writes about this this England past that's just beautiful, often quite melancholy, tragic books as well. Um, Cider with Rosie is one of my favourite books. Again, just exquisite, just beautifully, beautifully done. Um, and often I like books that deal with nostalgia or coming of age the passing of time. I find all those things quite moving. Um, and yeah, anything that, that's anything set in the North. Um, so Jeanette Winterson's um, Orange is Not the Only Fruit. I, I, I especially enjoy that because it was set in, in Accrington, which is quite near to um, where, where I'm from in Blackburn. Um, yeah, widely. So new books, old books, children's books, any book really. And um, you were talking about coming of age and uh, moving on to the reluctant bride. Then, that's it has something of that, doesn't it? Because this is is about um, a marriage uh, and a tragic ending to it. But it's about y somebody young who is on the verge of coming of age, if you like. Absolutely. So that story has all kinds of influences from my past, um, as you can imagine, but. The story of the bride, her visual of, of, of her stepping into the moonlight at the beginning of the story, that, that was the first thing that came to my head. And then the rest of the story has all spun off that. In the Asian culture, maybe not so much now, but certainly um, in the 1980s, 70s, 60s, all that kind of era, a lot of women, particularly in rural Pakistan, didn't have a particularly good life. They were seen as, as chattel, as goods, as belonging to their future husbands. Marriages were betrothed when they were young girls, uh, five, six, that wasn't unusual. Um, my mum was 14 when she married my dad, he was 30. He then brought her over to the UK in the 1960s and she pretended she was older than she was at the time. And uh, so her own story kind of resonates in this as well because it's like she was given a life that she didn't really want she, she made the best of it and she loved having all of her six children but I think she had a very hard marriage with my dad um he was also a victim in his own way because he was just following whatever his community and culture and society were telling him were perfectly normal things to do so they were both trapped by the conventions of their upbringings and the lady in the story is similarly trapped it's what it's what is expected she comes from a good household she was married off to a man who was from an equally good household. As far as their respective parents were concerned, it was a good match. Romance and love and anything else just didn't come into it. So even though it's fiction, it's, it really is based on stories that I've heard growing up, stories that are sometimes read happening in, in, in rural Pakistan, rural India. It's, it's a tragedy of it that just breaks my heart. I think, oh my goodness, they're but all helpless in their own way. I think you'd written a longer version of it, and we did the short of it. We did about the 3,000-word version. Uh, the 5,000-word version is the one that I sent off to the competition. It didn't win the competition or, or get shortlisted. I think in the end, they literally chose three people, and that's fair enough. So 5,000 won, that has much more detail and more descriptions, so it just colours it even more and you have descriptions of smells and the sights that they're seeing and the, the the version that you've read is the tighter version and that's the version that's been published in this anthology so it's it's been there shouldn't really be any slack words in there everything should be there for a, a reason every everything material is still in the 3000 pound uh, in the 3000 word story so the reader isn't missing out on anything um, of essence the only thing that they're not getting are just a bit more descriptions and, and sensory details. So I, yeah, it felt very tight, and it was it was a, a beautifully constructed story. I thought, in that you, you start, you know, there's a switch, isn't there? There's the famous 
switch at the end information is revealed and it turns the whole thing on its on its tail so that was what uh, so that was the standout for me that the twist and we can talk a bit about that the others as we're talking about that were some of the visuals i think you talk about her like an ember and i saw her in, in her red dress and uh, with the gold uh, and that so a lot of the visuals were really whoa you know very bright also for me not being familiar really with pakistani culture is is about the the mo the mythology and and the folklore and and some of the things you know which which aren't as familiar to people and i think we've read a a ton of stories from the victorian early modern period which come from a particular class of people usually in england usually quite wealthy people and so this was very different you know but it had it had all those requisite things it had the twist it had the foreshadowing and when you read it you know when you've read it and you, as you have and i have and you you see you go ah that's what that means now on the first pass through you don't get it but th then if you go through again ah that's that's foreshadowing that 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 links to this later on you know yeah that's absolutely right yeah um i set out to write a story that a ghost story that wasn't set in the usual absolutely the usual places and settings and I love an old haunted house and a mansion and honestly, a, 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 a deserted English, a English country lane. Absolutely love it. But I, I thought, you know what, for the competition, uh, uh, let's do something a bit different. That set, a setting that's not normally seen and a cultural reference that, that's not normally heard of. So people have heard of things like Banshees, the Irish ghost, and um, there'll be other, uh, the golem from the... Um, Jewish background, oh, yeah, that's right, Prague as well. So all those stories we've heard of, but the Chirail, which is something that I've grown up with, that I heard stories from my mum, I thought, I, I'm sure none of my English friends have ever heard of this. And that's, I thought, okay, a Chirail, rural Pakistan, has got a really nice setting, a really interesting main character, and some of those visuals of the bride and, and the fire and the flames and the deserted old Haveli. Haveli is like an old mansion. So I thought, right, let's go with it. And the Chirela, for me, my mum used to tell us stories about them, like any Asian mum would have told her children. And it, was, it, and it was normally told to us as a story to make us behave. So like, if you don't behave, the Chirela will come for you at night. So then I, there you'd be in your bed at night, absolutely trembling, um, thinking that you'd hear these footsteps outside your windows. And always thinking about this poor woman out there who has feet were always pointing backwards. So it's it's just such a curious detail, these feet that are pointing backwards. And that chilled me as a child and still chills me. I think, oh, what a horrible detail. Yeah. Um, and I wonder what it means. Well, you know, it doesn't mean anything, but but what I think it's about being wrong. That My, my first impression is that this is wrong. And uh, I said something recently about uh, about dolls and how they're, almost human this uncanny valley as it's called and but there's something about them that isn't and i wonder if the, the you know it, the jurel i think can pass as human in many cases but the, except for the feet that's it absolutely absolutely so in essence they're quite um demonic female spirits so they have uh set have wild hair and black tongues and saggy breasts and just a, a black back and all these kind of awful awful features but they can turn themselves into anything they want to as, as they're shapeshifters. So often they'll become beautiful women because they then want to enchant men. Generally, it's men who have wronged them in their lives. So often it's women who have died in childbirth or who have died as a result of the actions of their in-laws or their husband or neglect or something like that. So they'll come back as these very attractive women and then they'll ensnare these men and then work their way through the males of the family uh, at first, sucking out their blood or killing them in some way or, or drawing out their life force. It's that it, they're kind of, they're out for vengeance. So they've been wronged and they're out for vengeance. And that's quite a powerful image. Again, this very feminist image, actually, in a community, in a culture that, that is often quite patriarchal. It fascinates me that we've got this very strong female spirit. Maybe hit the nail on the head there. It's a compensatory, you know, unconscious. I mean, if we're going to get into Jung, who I keep coming back to, you know, 
uh, yeah, the, the society on in the daylight, if you like, is this patriarchal, but but in in the, in the nighttime, um, it the opposite arises and 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 rights uh, wrongs. And of course, one of the functions of ghosts in most ghost stories in in lo- lots of cultures is to right wrongs. They're they're moral beings in lots of ways. They're about putting things right from beyond the grave. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, it's quite interesting that often these women from those kind of cultural backgrounds, particularly in the rural uh, uh, backgrounds, would have had very little voice. So in in life, they would have they wouldn't really have had very much influence. So again, in death, they can be larger than life. They can um, they can take down all these people that treated them badly or neglected them. Again, it's just such a powerful image. And for the story, what I've purposely done is I've given it another twist and I've made the Jarel a male. Now that isn't usual, usually it's female, but I thought, you know what, I'm gonna twist it again. I'm gonna make it a 21st century story. I'm just gonna give it a further twist. And there's nothing in any of the mythology or literature that I've read about Jarels that say that they have to be females. They just tend to be females. Okay. okay. Yeah, and the twist, of course, is we, we go along believing. I mean, she comes from the tree. What kind of tree was it that they hide in? The tree is a people tree, and that's known in Indian and Pakistani mythology as being quite a holy tree. In, in Christianity, we have, we have like the Rowan tree, uh, those kind of trees which have significance. The people tree is, is a tree that in Indian mythology is said to be populated by jinns and ghosts and jarails. So you're always told not to shelter under a people tree. Don't go into, don't have a we under a tree because you don't know what spirits might be there. So all those things that the story starts off with are things that I would have heard growing up, even though we didn't have people trees in Blackburn, but it was like any tree, but the people tree particularly is, is not to be, is where they are. It's like give them a wide berth and treat them with. And so when she bed. steps out from that tree, that is the signal to anybody who's familiar with that. Aha, we know what she is. You know, she's we know right, absolutely. Except we're wrong. Except we're right. Yes. So all throughout the book, I'm planting red herrings to make you think that obviously that she is the one who's uh, the uh, the Jarel, and the driver of the rickshaw, of course, also thinks that as well. Because he doesn't remember his own fate, does he? He doesn't remember what's happening. No, he to doesn't. Him. Mm. That's right. It's only when she kisses him when he gets this human touch that that memory is released so he has little fragments of of memory but nothing that he could construct a story around and then that's when he remembers actually he was in the fire um he and his girlfriend at the time did not survive and in a sense her relationship this unhappy marriage that she's been forced into which she escapes through the window from is a mirror of his happy relationship which was also um, societally damned, if you like. Yeah, That's so you've really got the point. two right. two relationships and they're mirrors of each other in a sense, yeah? Maybe. Yes, absolutely. Mm. And that's so interesting that they are both, as you say, even though one was a happy relationship and one was an unhappy relationship, both were condemned by their, their society. So they neither of them could win, which is almost like, in that case, what did society want from them? Um, but yeah, you're right. She's shows real presence of, of character and strength of character in, in as much as that she's leaving her marital home on the day of her wedding. I mean, the repercussions for, for her and the family of such an event would have been awful. And people would have talked about it for years to come. Do you remember Blah Blah's daughter left her husband at the wedding? And, and incredulously as well, because, I mean, there she is with this guy who successfully, look, on paper, it's a perfect match. Perfect match, and and then she said, "But um, where where in all of this is is love?" And that the rickshaw driver says, "But what's love got to do with it?" Even though he was at the Haveli because of love, because of love, absolutely, yes. Yeah, so it, it's it's so interesting that sometimes the men in that community can often not see it through the eyes of the of the woman, and and because it's just culturally so ingrained in all of us all of all of people from that background that this is how it is it's often not challenged and it takes guts to be the one who's saying no i'm not going to do this i'm querying this i'm i'm walking away from it especially a marriage like this one that was just 
on paper, as you say, absolutely amazing. He was a good looking guy, loads of money, huge standing in the village. Her life was made if, she, if she'd wanted it to be. So for her, she needed love. There we are. So you've finished your novel. That's going. Are you writing anything at the moment? So the novel's done. The short story's in incandescence, as that's out. That came out last month. The book I'm writing, actually, I'm writing two books at the minute. So as part of my megaphone mentoring scheme, I'm writing a children's book, uh, which is called Jollywood. And that's set in that's set in a, in an alternative world that's based on Bollywood. So everything is larger than life. People sing and dance at, at the drop of a hat. Emotions are ramped up to the nth degree. And it's peopled by jinns, which are also a part of, of Muslim culture. So jinns, i.e. genies, shapeshifters again. So I'm, I'm obviously quite fascinated by these kind of beings, these, these beings that can, that can look human if they want to, but are not human. So that's aimed at children, aimed at about maybe 10 to 12. Early stages, I've, I'm in about chapter nine or something of the book, but I'm really enjoying it. And it's, it's not based, on, it's not based on, on me at all, so that's quite nice. And then the other book I'm writing is a memoir, which actually is based on me. So that, that will look into the world of Northern Boy, of my first novel, in more detail. And it'll just look at the whole thing about growing up in two cultures. When I was growing up, um, I also had a really bad stammer, so, uh, so I'll be dealing with the whole issue of, of what it's like to have a stammer, where you can't speak, where you're processing every single word you're thinking about, where something that everyone does so normally, it's that like breathing for most people. If you, if you have a stammer, it's not like that at all. How that shaped me at growing up, looking at the culture clash, growing up in this very poor working class community in Lancashire, 50% Pakistani, 50% white, neither community really like the other, all the tensions that happened at the time. It's much better now, I'm pleased to say, but at the time growing up, it's a scary place. And no doubt that had an effect on my stammer as well. There we are, yeah. Well, it's been great talking to you. Where can people get hold of your work, you know, if they want to, if they're inspired to follow it up? Oh, thank you. Um, they can read the short story in the actual form of the book. So. Um, mainstream um, is the title. It's published by Incandescent. If, if you just go to um, um, Amazon or Google, Incandescent Mainstream, it's, it's a collection of 30 short stories. So it's, uh, it's 15 writers like me who, who are underrepresented. So it'll be BAME, queer, working class writers, uh, along with 15 established writers, uh, writers such as Kit Deval, who's just amazing, Kerry Hudson, who's just fantastic, Phil Ridley, amazing author again, Paul McVeigh. So Mainstream by Incandescent, I, can, I can't recommend it enough. It's just 30 amazing short stories by 30 amazing writers. They can find me uh, on my website, which is ihusseinwriter.com. I'll put links to all these things in the show notes as well. Thank you. And they can find me on Twitter as well. I'm uh, I Hussein writer on there as well. And I'm really hoping that in the coming year uh, or two, that Northern Boy, my first book, will be out there as well. So I'm currently keeping everything crossed and just hoping that somebody picks it up. And, and maybe one day it'll be televised by the BBC, which would also be amazing. And when, and when you are, you know, massively famous, people can come and look at this interview and, uh, you know, and there we are. So that would be great. Oh, that'd be amazing. Tony, thank you so much. Honestly, I love your work. Just keep doing it. And I look forward to every story. You, you too. You keep doing it. Yours as well. I, re I love the story. I really did. Yeah. Anyway, it's been great, great talking to you. You too, Tony. Thank you so much. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come dies. back. Isn't that so? Isn't that study combat? Isn't that study combat?